from the latest on Caribbean cruises to kosher safaris, pilgrimages to Jewish Eastern Europe and award-winning wines and international cuisine in sun-drenched Tel Aviv. Sit back and enjoy the trip with the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition. I'm Mark Gordon and I'm with my travel buddy, David Harris. Hello there. Things have opened up. When I say things, I mean the skies have opened up. Shops and restaurants in countries around the world are beginning to open up again in some, while others are still way behind as we're learning as we try to produce these podcasts there are some countries who are saying yes yes we want to be interviewed now and others are saying to us well hang on we're not there just yet but let's imagine for a minute that you could travel to three places in the world where would you go i've had a year to work on my my bucket list my wish list obviously india i know it's really a bit tacky but i want to go to las vegas ka-ching it's one of those places with the lights and the... Ga- I'm not a big gambler at all, but for some reason I'm, I'm drawn to Las Vegas. I think the other place I'd like to go is Australia, maybe... Yeah, no, Australia. It's a whole big country to explore. I would say New Zealand, but that's probably on your mine. list. So, New Zealand, so you is can edit num- that out. New Zealand is number one on mine. The question then is where next? I've got a long, long list. If, if, if there was peace in the Middle East, true peace in the Middle East, I would love to go to Iran, not to Tehran, but to see southern Iran. Some of those cities are preserved the way they've been for hundreds of years. That would be amazing. Uh, We've said New Zealand, and I'll go with... It's a tie between southwestern France, southern Italy, and Uzbekistan. So any of those. All of them. All of them, absolutely. Um, well, why limit yourself? And, and, and hopefully what we will do in the coming months is at least bring you the voices from those types of places. Mark, where are we headed in this episode? We're heading to Spain to hear about the richness of its Jewish heritage. And get your taste buds ready for a culinary tour of Montreal, Canada. But before we begin, a couple of questions to whet your appetite. Question one. The Travels of Benjamin was written by 12th century Spanish Jewish traveller Benjamin of Tudela. But from which city did Benjamin start his journey? Add question number two. In which year did Montreal host the Olympic Games? Answers at the end of the show. Mention the word Spain to many Jews and they immediately think of 1492, one of the worst years in Jewish history, the expulsion that followed the Inquisition. But prior to that, Spanish Jews enjoyed a golden age filled with art, poetry, books of Jewish learning, science and much more. And today, Jews are enjoying a renaissance in the country. We spoke to Moises Hassan from JewishSevilla.com to find out more. I was actually born in Sevilla, which is in the south of Spain. I'm the first generation of my family born in Spain. My parents were actually born in Morocco, in the Spanish Morocco, and they moved into uh, Spain in the 1950s uh, in order to attend university in Madrid, and that's where they actually met. And then my father was offered a job in uh, in Sevilla, and this is how he ended up living in the city, and that's the reason I was born in Sevilla. So my background is Sephardic from uh, the north of Morocco. And what do you do? I have a degree in law which I actually never used. Nowadays, I'm very much into what I call Jewish tourism and Jewish education. So I provide uh, Jewish focus tours in my hometown, which is Sevilla, but I also create programs uh, for visitors that want to do the same all throughout Spain. So I have associates in some other places in Spain, Jewish as well. And we try to provide an overview about the, not only about the Jewish history of Spain, but also about its present and uh, sometimes about its future, if there is some. I'm also a lecturer at the university here in Sevilla about Holocaust studies and anti-Semitism. Spanish Jewish history is said to go back as far as the Bible. Is that correct? I would consider this a legend from the moment that we don't have evidence. It might be possible and probably it was that Jews arrived in southern Iberian Peninsula 
perhaps in times of King Solomon, uh, trading with the Phoenicians. I'm, I'm sure that there were some, but from what we know, they never settled down in southern Spain. So actually, if we want to find uh, archaeological evidence, we need to move forward to Roman times. In Roman times, the, the end of the second century CE or the beginning of the third, we'll already have some archaeological evidence, uh, tombstones, some with Hebrew inscription. So this is the moment that we can really say and affirm and prove that there was a Jewish presence in southern Iberian Peninsula. So since, let's say, the end of the second century until the expulsion that took place in 1492. That brings us nicely on to the next question. I think for those people who are not from Spain and Portugal as well, uh, that when we think about Jews in Spain, the first thing we think of is 1492 and the negatives. But give us a couple of examples of where in Spain is good for visitors to go who want to learn about the richness of the Jewish history of Spain. I have to say that the peak of Jewish presence in Spain, according to most of the uh, historians, is that in the 1300s, which could be the peak, there could have been perhaps 200,000 Jews all throughout Spain. However, the main cities would be Toledo, Cordoba, Sevilla, Barcelona, which was the kingdom of Aragon. Remember that Spain, before being Spain, it was divided in kingdoms. So there was also a nice presence in the kingdom of Aragon, including Barcelona, Girona, and Besalú. And then moving down south, as I said, Toledo, Segovia, also had a nice Jewish population, and more south, Sevilla, Córdoba, Lucena, which was a very important town, not extremely big, but very important, which had a very, very significant uh, Jewish presence. If you were to pick one of those for a tour today, which would you suggest people go to? Either Toledo or Córdoba. And for a very simple reason, even though Jewish history is rich in all of these places that I've mentioned before, unfortunately, there aren't many places to visit nowadays. The only places where you can really see something would be Toledo, where it keeps two synagogues, El Transito and Santa Maria la Blanca. And if we move down to, to the south, to Cordoba, we have also a very small synagogue from 1315, which has been preserved over the years. It was transforming many, many different buildings until it came out to the light that it was a synagogue. There tend to be a large number of Israeli tourists that come to Barcelona and Madrid to watch soccer. Is there some way when they come to Barcelona and Madrid to combine watching football with then taking in some Jewish heritage? I've had some people coming down from Madrid to Sevilla. It is possible to do a, a, a one-day excursion in the high-speed train. From Barcelona, actually, the only possibility would be to fly. I, I have a, a partner in Barcelona She's Jewish and she does pretty much like what I do here in Sevilla. And she and I know that she's been taking people coming from Israel to see Barcelona. Uh, the following day, they go to uh, for a tour. If somebody wanted to see not just the Jewish history and traditions, but also the best of the Christian world and the Moorish influences on Spain, is there one place that would be good for that? Cordoba would be the city. It's not possible to separate the three religions when thinking about Spain. It's true that Muslims were here in the Iberian Peninsula of almost eight, for 800 years. So it, it's a long, long time. But it doesn't mean that they were fighting against each other all the time. So the truth is that most of the time they had a, a collaboration and they coexisted out of mixed elements. For example, when we visit Cordoba, there is the today the main the cathedral of Cordoba is actually the building that Muslims built for themselves to act as a mosque. So it's a Moorish cathedral. So actually, where you can see both elements combined, and this happens all throughout Spain, especially in the southern part of the of the Berean Peninsula. What about people who want to keep kosher? Are there particular places that are good for them or can kosher food be accessed across Spain? It's not easy. In Spain, this goes with, uh, with the cities which, uh, that have the biggest Jewish communities, which are Madrid and Barcelona 
and then also in the south in Costa del Sol, the area of Malaga, Marbella, and Torremolinos. On the other hand, though, it is possible to deliver, and in one day we, we can bring kosher fruit from wh whatever. And moreover, in the last uh, years, some Spanish companies are manufacturing products which do have either a K for kosher or there is a list of products which have been approved for the chief rabbi of Spain, Rabbi Moshe, which are suitable for kosher eaters. Do you have a personal favorite site that maybe tourists are unaware of that you like to take them to when they come to Spain? My favorite city would be Cordoba. Cordoba, 1,000 years ago, it was like the, the center of the Western world. Probably there was no other city like Cordoba, perhaps uh, Constantinople in, in, in Turkey, right? So Cordoba is one of those cities which was like a main center of both Jewish life and, and also from a Moorish perspective, it was the capital of the caliphate. And at the same time, Cordoba is known for being the cradle of the Rambam of Rabbi Moshe ben uh, Maimon, right? Uh, so he was able to, even though he had to, to leave the city at the age of 13, he got very much of what he became later because of living in Cordoba, which was the center of the world. And uh, we cannot forget that there were perhaps 70 libraries in the city of Cordoba in the 10th century, which is something remarkable. This is a little bit after Judaism started to decline in Babylon, and when the academies of Sura and Pumbedita started to decline. And at the same time, Cordoba in the Iberian Peninsula and Lucena started to flourish. For anybody who would like to be in touch with you, to hear more about your tours, how can they do so? I'm found on the internet, Jewish Sevilla with an A at the end, dot com, but also JewishSpain.net. Moses Hassanam Salem, it's been Great listening to you. Thank you. And hopefully we will have you and maybe some of your colleagues from around Spain on future podcasts. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Severe fact file. Iberia currently has no direct flights from the US to Sevilla, but it is possible to fly via Madrid from New York City, Boston, Chicago, Miami and Los Angeles. American Airlines also fly into Madrid from New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Charlotte and Dallas, Fort Worth. Air Europa has flights to Madrid from New York City and Miami. In Europe, it is possible to fly non-stop to Sevilla from Paris, London, Amsterdam and Frankfurt. Iberia has has direct flights from Tel Aviv to both Madrid and Barcelona. El Al also offers direct flights from Tel Aviv to both Madrid and Barcelona. A taxi will take you from Sevilla Airport to the city centre at around 25 minutes. Cost is around 25 euros. There's also a bus that runs from 5 a.m. to midnight that will take you from the airport into the city centre in 40 minutes. Price is 4 euros. Moises recommends the following hotels. The five-star Alfonso XIII and the Gran Melia Colón. The four-star La Casas de la Juderia. The three-star Hotel Amadeus. And the boutique hotel Corral de Rey. The currency is the euro. A euro will cost you $1.20. There are no kosher facilities in Sevilla. However, kosher food can be delivered easily for Malaga, Madrid and or Gibraltar. And it's time for the latest news headlines brought to you by the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition. Wizz Air launched its Tel Aviv Abu Dhabi route on the 18th of April. This followed Abu Dhabi's decision to add Israel to its green list. That means travellers from Israel don't need to quarantine on arrival. Tickets are already on sale on wizair.com and the airline's mobile app, with fares starting at 89 shekels or $27 one way. As the skies open, El Al will offer new flights to Belgrade, Sofia, Paphos, Rhodes, Crete and Thessaloniki. Ben-Gurion Airport Railway Station reopened for passengers with a vaccination or recovery certificate. The station had been closed since March 2020. The US and Israel set up a joint team to explore Israel joining the Visa Waiver Program, allowing Israelis 90-day visits for business and tourism. Later this year, we'll be featuring Dallas, Texas in detail. But for now, here's a taste, quite literally. It's 50 years since Dallas became the home of the frozen margarita. 
The city is celebrating the anniversary with a 50-day, $50 giveaway along its famous Margarita Mile. On the last day, May 11th, a trip to Dallas is the special prize. See if you can win at margaritamiledallas.com. Jewish cuisine has developed considerably since the days of the Polish shtetls and the villages high in Morocco's Atlas Mountains. This time, our gastronomic journey takes us to Canada and Kat Romanow from the Museum of Jewish Montreal. I am the director of food programming at the museum, as well as a Jewish food historian. Um, and I get to organize the variety of food programs um, that happen at the museum. I get to research Jewish food and share that with um, our visitors. Tell us a little bit about the Museum of Jew. Is it called the Museum of Jewish Montreal or the Montreal Jewish Museum? Museum of Jewish Montreal. Um, yeah, people get that confused. <laughs> So the museum is a is an innovative place to connect with Montreal's Jewish life and identity. Um, we share a diverse heritage and work to create new cultural experiences. And we do this through a variety of ways. We offer programming prior to the pandemic. We were doing this in person. But um, since uh, March of last year, we've been offering online programming that touches on art, Jewish history, food, among other things. We offer a variety of walking tours. And again, those were happening in person prior to the pandemic. And people would get to learn about the history and culture of the Jewish community in Montreal while walking around the historical Jewish quarter of the city. Since the pandemic, we launched um, our first virtual tour. That's uh, we, where we adapted our most popular tour, Making Their Mark, and turned it into a virtual experience. So anyone from around the world can join um, and experience a bit of Jewish Montreal. I'm going to almost challenge you now with the next question. I think for most people, when we think North America, Jewish food, we think about the delis and bagels in New York. So what does Montreal have to offer? Montreal has so much to offer. It really does have a rich and unique Jewish food culture um, that goes all the way back to the early 1900s when Ashkenazi Jews first began to settle in the city. So it's an old and a food culture that's very much entrenched in the food culture of our city. Um, so foods that uh, Jews brought to the city, like bagels and smoked meat, have become iconic Montreal foods. So they're foods that are beloved by locals and they're foods that are must tries for tourists who are visiting the city. And they've really worked to shape the food culture of, of Montreal. We're so lucky in the fact that we have Jewish run family businesses, food businesses and restaurants, so bakeries and restaurants that remain and that have been in the city for over 70 years and are still serving, you know, the foods that they first served when they opened. So these some of these restaurants are Walensky's and Beauties and Moishes. So in going to these restaurants, you really get a taste of the history of Jewish food in Montreal. And we also have this amazing Jewish food revival going on in the city. Um, so there's a new wave of young Jews who are opening Jewish restaurants and bakeries like Hof Kelston, Arthur's, Sumac. And they're really continuing the rich Jewish food tradition that exists in Montreal and also revitalizing it at the same time. So it's it has just as much as uh, New York in terms of, of Jewish food. And it's definitely a place that any Jew should come visit and eat in. Yeah. Is there a type of food on the tour that people will get to taste that's uniquely Montreal? Is, is there any poutine? <laughs> there is no poutine on the tour as much as I, I do love it myself. The most recognizable Montreal Jewish food are bagels. You know, we have a, a unique bagel culture in this city and in a unique bagel. It creates debates, especially for those New Yorkers who come on our tour. Our bagels are, are hand rolled, cooked in wood fired ovens and are really unlike bagels you can get anywhere else in the world. 
And, and, and then, of course, there's the smoked meat as well. So those are the most, I think, recognizable Montreal Jewish foods that you get on the tour. But there is a variety of other foods that you get to taste as well. Who comes on the tour? Is it mainly Jewish tourists, Jewish visitors from Montreal, or is it a, a cross-section, non-Jewish visitors as well? It's mainly Jewish visitors, especially Jews from the States. But you know, we've been running this tour since 2015. So we do also get um, non-Jews who are coming on this tour who are interested in learning more about, you know, Jewish food culture in Montreal and the Jewish community as well. And we also get people who are foodies or into food and use travel as a way to taste different kinds of foods and are interested in learning about the food cultures and the places that they're traveling to. It's interesting that throughout this conversation, you've used the word Jewish, not the word kosher. So in terms of the tour, is it a kosher tour? Is the meat kosher? Is there a vegetarian option? How does all that work? It is not a kosher tour. The first stop on our tour is a kosher bakery called Cheskis. The pastries that we eat there are kosher, but the rest of the tour is not kosher. The food is not certified kosher. A lot of the restaurants we visit, they were once kosher restaurants, but gave up their certification um, as the years went on. But although it's not certified kosher, we're not serving anything that's non-kosher. So, you know, the meat is, is beef and Although we mix dairy and meat throughout the tour, we don't mix it at any of the stops. There is a vegetarian op option at Walensky's. It's a little harder when we go to Schwartz's and eat smoked meat. They, they are quite a meat-heavy restaurant. So you get to have a pickle and a Cod's Cherry Coats <laughs> cola if you go there. <laughs> it, I have to say, it's not a great tour for vegans or people who are gluten-free since it is very carb heavy. So Mark, when eventually the two of us get to Montreal, you're the one who's going to be going on this tour because I'm, I'm the veggie. Is there, in addition to, to the food side of things, is there any heritage element to the tour? You've talked about the fact that, you know, Jewish food has a history. So how does that play out on the tour? Yeah, so it was really important to us to include information about the history of the Jewish community in this tour alongside the food that we're eating. As my work as a Jewish food historian, whenever I talk to people about food, I always bring in the historical piece and try to tell people about the history of the food they're eating, where it comes from, and the stories that go along with it, because I think it makes food that much more meaningful um, when you know about everything that's behind that bagel that you're eating or that smoked meat sandwich that you're eating. And alongside all of the food history, we also include history of the Jewish community in Montreal to give context to what we're talking about, what we're seeing, and the places that we're walking between. How would our listeners get in contact with you? So for the museum, you can visit our website and there is a contact form on our website um, that you can email us through or you can email info at imjm.ca to um, email us, ask us any questions and book a tour. I'll be leaving the museum um, this week Aww. to pursue my, yeah, it's been a really amazing seven years at the museum and I've learned so much but I'm leaving to focus on my work as a Jewish food historian. There's no doubt I'll be working with the museum again um, in the future. But if anyone wants to contact me, you can email me at thewanderingchew at gmail.com. And it's chew like eating. <laughs> That's brilliant. Chew. That's a great name, thewanderingchew.com. Kat Romano, thank you so much indeed. And we wish you the very best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you so much. It was so great to be here today. The Montreal Fact File. Air Canada has flights into Montreal from most major European cities, Tel Aviv, Los Angeles and San Francisco, while Air Canada Express and Air Canada Rouge cover most US and Canadian cities. A taxi to central Montreal will cost you around 40 Canadian dollars. You can also take an Uber and depending on destination it will cost between 30 and 38 Canadian dollars. The Express City Bus, the 747, travels between the airport and downtown Montreal. This will cost you 10 Canadian dollars and will take between 45 and 70 minutes. Hotels recommended by Cat. The Le Mount Steven in downtown, the Hotel 10 in Saint Laurent, 
the Hotel Uville in Old Montreal and the Hotel William Gray also in Old Montreal. For kosher restaurants, go to mk.ca slash kosher hyphen guide slash restaurants for a full list of kosher restaurants. Kat also recommends the following not kosher restaurants. Lawrence and Larry's, the Guillaume Bakery, Kemkoba, Mapul Mouillé, Patati Patata, Damas, Arthur's Nosh Bar, Bottega and Dinette Triple Crown. The currency is the Canadian dollar. A hundred Canadian dollars will cost you 77 and a half US dollars. A final useful fact, even if people greet you in French, most people speak English, so don't feel intimidated. And we'll give you the answers to our quiz questions in a few seconds. But first, as ever, our thanks to today's guests, Moises from Seville and Kat from Montreal. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and give us a five-star rating. And now the answers to the quiz. Question one. The Travels of Benjamin was written by 12th century Spanish Jewish traveller Benjamin of Tudela. But from which city did Benjamin start his journey? And the answer is Zaragoza. And question number two. In which year did Montreal host the Olympic Games? The answer? 1976. And your father was there, Mark? He was indeed. Was he competing? No, he won a competition to go to the 1976 Olympics. Absolutely amazing. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you on the next episode of the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition.